So, before we start, I really want to thank my supervisors, Chris, Alan and Reuben, for their support and contribution to this work. And also Ed, who was involved in the write-up of the publication that I'm going to be discussing today. So just to run through the format for the webinar, I'm going to start by giving you a background to randomization and some of the important concepts that are going to be needed for this presentation. The main part of the presentation is going to consist of the results from a recent publication, which was the systematic review looking at randomization method usage and associated study characteristics. And then I'm going to talk through some of the pre preliminary results from a second package of work from the thesis. And finally, what are we doing for the rest of my PhD? So let's start with a background of randomization. The randomized controlled trial is often considered the gold standard when evaluating interventions, and this is because of its ability to remove many different biases, such as selection bias, chronological bias and confounding. There's many different methods that exist, and each of these have different benefits and drawbacks, most commonly relating to balance and predictability. Each method will perform differently depending on the design of the trial. So some research has shown that simple randomization can have performance issues if you've got less than 200 participants. And there's other research that shows that block stratification that includes site as a variable can cause predictable sequences in unblinded trials. There is, however, a lack of consensus from researchers on when each method is most appropriate. When some, where some researchers, such as Stephen Sen, discuss the drawbacks of using restricted randomization and how the analysis methods of randomized controlled trials were designed for simple randomization, other researchers consider minimization as the gold standard. And I am going to discuss all of these methods, don't worry. Um, but before I do that, as I've mentioned, balance and predictability on the previous slide, but what are they? So balance is referring to having similar groups, which allows easier comparisons. So we can have group size balance, which is looking at having similar numbers of participants in each of the compared groups, but we can also have characteristic balance. And for characteristics that are thought to affect both the outcome and the performance of the treatment, it's really important to have an even split of these between groups to avoid issues of confounding. So in the case on the slide, uh, it's kind of a crude representation of gender and in these cases we've got a clear imbalance here which could cause analysis issues. So predictability on the other hand focuses around guessing sequence allocations. So generally the focus is on, on how easily a recruiter can predict the next allocation of a sequence with the thought that a predictable sequence will allow the possibility of selection bias because knowledge of the next allocation might affect how recruiters are recruiting their participants. It's worth noting that both of these things are considered desirable to minimize biases, but neither are essential. Some researchers, Stephen Sen, as I've said before, recognize the benefits of balance, but also state that the analysis methods underpinning randomized controlled trials were designed for simple randomization. So predictability would be a much more important issue. Also, while simple randomization has no built-in guarantee of balance, balance can of course still be achieved because the method is completely random. So with that in mind, I just want to take some time to go through four methods of randomization that I'm going to be talking about quite consistently within this presentation. So for simplicity, each of the examples that I'm going to talk about look at a two-arm trial, so two different treatment groups, and we're looking at getting an equal number of participants in each of those treatment groups. But all of these methods can be adapted to look at different trial designs. So starting with simple randomization, this is kind of considered the original randomization method, and it works essentially on the flip of a coin. So that means that for each allocation, the chance of receiving each treatment is around 50-50, and it's entirely unpredictable because we can't guess with any accuracy what the result of a coin flip would be, unless you've got biased coin flips. Um, it does have the drawback, though, that by chance groups could end up being uneven. If you flip a coin 20 times, it's entirely possible to get 19 heads on one tail, and there's no guarantee that the characteristics would be even between groups either. This is obviously quite an extreme case, and the method is fairly safe for large sample sizes. Another method is block 
randomization. And this aims to tackle the issue of uneven groups by ensuring that throughout a randomization sequence, we have an even number of allocations to each of the groups. So this essentially deals with the issue of chronological bias. Chronological bias can occur if there's differences in the effect of a treatment over the trial's life. So for example, if there is a change to standard care partway through the treatment, uh, the recruitment window. This means that we need to balance this throughout the trial, not just at the end of the trial. So I'm going to use the example here of a block size of four, but it can be done for other block sizes and even differing numbers of block sizes. So first, the number of blocks has to be a multiple of the number of treatments. So for a block size of four, we're going to allocate two of our participants to treatment A and two of our participants to treatment B. So we're gonna find all of the different orders where we can have two allocations to each of the treatment. And in this case, we have six, which is shown here. So thinking back to simple randomization, if we were to roll a dice, each roll of the dice is going to give us the next four allocations in the sequence. So if we roll our dice and we get a two, the first allocation would be A, the second B, the third A, and then the fourth B. And at this point, we would re-roll the dice to get the next four allocations. So some of you might have noticed that this sequence is more predictable. We're always gonna know what the fourth allocation is. And in some cases, such as this first one, we would actually know what the third allocation is as well. So in practice, issues like this can be mitigated by not telling the recruiters how many blocks are going to be used. And in addition to this, commonly, we're going to have different sizes of blocks in the same randomization. So here you might use block sizes of four, six and eight. And this is referred to as permuted blocks. However, this still isn't accounting for a confounding from characteristics. And this is where stratification comes in. So the aim of stratification is to get this balance of characteristics between the groups. If you imagine two characteristics that we're expecting to be related to the outcome in the intervention, in this case, age and sex. If we look at it in the two by two grid as we have here, we can see that <clears throat> each cell of the grid represents a specific set of characteristics for the participant. So for males under the age of 50, we've got list A, for males over the age of 50, list B, and so on. So if our next allocation is going to be a male under the age of 50, we're going to take the allocations from this list here, each of these having separate lists. We're gonna take the allocation from this list here, which here is an allocation to treatment one. So each of these individual lists could be generated either using simple randomization, but quite often block randomization would be used, which allows us to balance both the characteristics and the sizes of the groups. So the final method that I wanna talk about, but by no means is it the final method that exists, is minimization. The idea of this method is that the next allocation will directly depend on all of the previous allocations with respect to these important characteristics. So here we've got the same two variables, sex and age, but this time each cell of our grid is telling us how many have a unique characteristic. So where for stratification, the total of all of these is giving us the total sample size. Here, A, B, E, and F will give us the total sample size and C, D, G, and H will give us the total sample size. So again, if our next allocation is going to be a male under the age of 50, we're going to take the totals of each of these. So for treatment one, we've got A males and C participants under 50. And for treatment two, we have E males and G participants over 50, uh, under 50. Um, we're just going to add those totals together. And the way that minimization works is we're going to allocate this to the smallest total. So some of you might have noticed that if someone wants to keep track, they might be able to work out where each of the participants are going to go. And it's because of this that we would normally add a random element, generally 20%. So this means 80% of the time, this allocation will be minimized using this algorithm. And the other 20% of the time, it will randomly allocate to the other treatment. So with that background in mind, I wanna now talk about some of the work that we have conducted, looking at a systematic review of RCTs. So starting here, 
uh, with the aims. Initially, we'd got two aims to identify which randomization methods were most commonly being used and to identify any aspects of the trial design that might be associated with this choice. So whilst we were doing background research into this topic, I came across a paper by Cialino et al that was looking at the reporting of trials before and after changes to the consult guidance. Um, and although this didn't answer our specific question, it did provide us with some trial fi figures from the year 2014, which allowed us to come up with our third aim to compare the choice of randomization method with this 2014 review. Just to note, the reference for this review is at the bottom of the slide, but I will have all references on the final slide as well. So how did we go about doing this? I reviewed papers in The Lancet, the New England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of the American Medical Association and the British Medical Journal. All of the articles were published in 2019 and contained the word randomized, spelled with either an S or a Z, and also, or also RCT in the title or the abstract. In order to widen the scope of the review, the end, the National Institute of Health Research's Health Technology Assessment Library was also included. Um, so we couldn't use as fine of a criteria within the library search engine. So instead, the search criteria was publications labeled as primary research in 2019. The Cialino review was also conducted in this initial four journals. So we also extracted the 2014 papers from the HTA library to allow comparisons with this review. All of the papers were reviewed by myself and then a random sample of 24 papers was reviewed independently by another reviewer. Uh, these were compared and we decided that if the number of disagreement in all of the variables was greater than 5%, then a greater sample would be looked at. So I don't know how well you can see this, but I'm gonna zoom in. Um, this slide is showing a screenshot of the data extraction database that we used. So we collected a variety of information on each of the trials. Um, so we started with main trial information, such as the sample size, um, when the trial started and information on the disease specification. We then also collected information on the randomization method used. So we took the text from the methods section uh, for, and then each of the randomization methods that was used was ticked. Um, the reason we collected the information in this way was to allow us to identify if a trial was using more than one of the randomization methods. So for example, trials using block stratification, or there are some trials that would use both stratification and minimization. We collected information on blinding status for different groups um, where this information was available in the text, um, although quite often this information couldn't be obtained or it couldn't accurately be obtained. So, for example, a trial might state that it was double blinded, but not state exactly which parties were blinded. Um, we got information on trial design features, such as whether it was multi-center and the number of centers, the number of arms that the trial had and whether it was cluster randomized, as well as other features, such as if it had a factorial or crossover design. Finally, we collected information on any characteristics that were included in the randomization, which included how the, randomized, uh, how the variable was included, whether it was using stratification, minimization, or another method, the format of the variable, was it continuous, was it binary or categorical, and how it was included in the randomization. So for example, a continuous variable would need to be split down into categories in some way. Um, and if it was split down into categories, how many categories did it have? Um, we also looked at if there was any mention that the variable had been included in subsequent analyses. So you might also be able to see these little red boxes here that talk about the protocol being needed. Um, these were ticked in the event that some of the information was not available in the main paper. So in these situations, the protocol or the statistical analysis plan was reviewed for additional details. And if the randomization method was still not clear, the first author was contacted for this information. So moving on to some of our results. This search criteria gave us 633 articles and of those 414 were considered appropriate for data extraction. 
For the first four journals, the most common reason that an article was not included was that it contained a systematic review or a meta-analysis. So it was flagging as having the word randomized, but didn't actually contain a randomized control trial. For the NIHR Health Technology Assessment Library, where we couldn't be as strict with that search criteria, the most common reason for non-inclusion was that the research was qualitative, and so it didn't contain details of a randomized controlled trial. It's also worth noting that we knew that some of the trials included in the NIHR HTA journal would have their final result published in one of the other journals. So as you can see here, there was 11 duplicates uh, that were removed from the NIHR library. So in this case, the main data extraction was conducted using the journal paper. And then the HTA library publication was only used if information was missing from the other journals paper. So when considering the quality of the extraction, the second reviewer found that disagreements fell at around 1%, which was less than our specified 5% limit. A lot of the disagreement was due to differences in interpretation. So for example, with disease specification, there were some papers that looked at cancer and heart disease as comorbidities. Uh, and so we had to choose to classify them as one or the other. And we occasionally would put different classifications in. So now for the rest of the results, um, this is looking at those 414 papers, but 385 of those were extracted in 2019 because 29 of them are for, from 2014 and only for the Cialino comparison. So of that 385 papers, 348 were individually randomized trials. So they're going to be the focus of the rest of this discussion. The other 37, papers were cluster randomized studies and so they were considered outside the scope of the review as quite often different methods would be used to allocate clusters. So this pie chart is showing the randomization methods used in each of the individually randomized studies in 2019 in those five journals. So the first thing that I want to point out is that 95% of the trials that we looked at were made up of a combination of the methods that I mentioned before. So simple block stratification or minimization, which shows that these four methods really dominate most of the method usage in these journals. Of the 18 that are classified as other, six of them use both stratification and minimization. Um, so quite often this was done where it was stratified by site and then with insight, it was minimized using other variables. And the other 12 included other methods, such as different dynamic methods other than minimization. Three trials used Bayesian methods, and there was also big stick and bias coin used. So we can see that block stratification is the most commonly used method with just under half of the trials using this method. But if we take this a step further, and just consider trials that use some form of stratification, this actually falls at over two thirds of the trials, which really shows a preference for some form of stratification being used. So the table that I want to present in the next slide covers those trials that have at least one covariate within the randomization. So I just wanna walk through how this looks a little bit. So of the 348 trials, 53 of them didn't use any randomization variables because they use simple and block randomization. And these two methods don't use any kind of controlling for confounding variables within the method. Of the 283 trials that remained, these all had at least one covariate within their randomization. So we had 228 using stratification by combining these two categories here. 49 using minimization, and as I mentioned on the other slide, six of them used both stratification and minimization. So looking at each of the trials, this table shows us each of the randomization methods split by whether none of the covariates were included in the analysis, or at least one covariate was included in the analysis. So in a trial with three covariates, if just one of those was included in the analysis, it would be in this category here. So again, simple and block randomization, we don't have anything here for those because they're not including covariates in the randomization. And then studies that, stratif that stratified on only center have been separated out here from the other stratified trials because in these cases they've only got the one covariate and that covariate is very specifically center. 
So scent was considered to be included in the analysis if it was accounted for in any way, fixed random effects. It didn't matter as long as it was included. For studies that had no covariates within the analysis, we can see that a higher percentage at 45% is using stratification with only center compared to those not in, that included a covariate in the analysis, which was at 12%. And this suggests that researchers seem much less likely to include center in subsequent analyses. But let's look at this in more depth. So we can look at this on an individual characteristic level as well. So from the previous slide, we had 283 trials that included a covariate in the randomization. But as any trialists here would know, often more than one covariate is included. So as I've mentioned before, we collected this individual covariate data and across these 283 trials, we ended up with 647 individual covariates included. So this table as before is looking at covariates not included in the analysis versus covariates included in the analysis. But in this case, because it's on an individual covariate level, this is just that, that variable being included. Um, so this is again giving a little bit more evidence towards the fact that center is often not included in the analysis. So we can see a lower percentage of covariates not included in the analysis at 27% were binary when compared to covariates included in the analysis at 41%. However, if we look at categorical non-ordinal variables, which are much more likely to be center, we can see 59% of the covariates not included in the analysis are categorical non-ordinal compared with 26% of variables included in the analysis. You can also see that the covariates not in the analysis tended to have a higher number of categories. So 43% of these covariates have more than five categories compared to just 16% of covariates that were included in the analysis. But how does this measure up when we compare it to the 2014 review? So the table here shows the characteristics of the trials reviewed in 2014 versus in 2019. So just a bit of explaining here, this first column is giving the results of the Cialino review as they were presented within that paper. This second column is combining these results with the 29 papers that we extracted from the HTA library back in 2014. And the final column is showing the results from our review. And the first thing I wanna note just here on this slide is the inclusion of the HTA library does appear to have increased the diversity of the trials included just a little bit. So we can see with the addition of the HTA library, that the number of cluster randomized tri trials has gone up from 4% to 7%, and trials including more than five covariates has risen from 2% to 8%. So although it is just a little bit of increase in diversity, we can see it is there. But for the main comparisons, there are three things of note that I really wanna, that I've highlighted with on, on the slide here. So when we consider the methods of randomization used, there appears to be an increase in the number of trials using simple randomization. So this is up from 1% in 2014 to 6% in 2019. And this is indicating an increase in the simplicity of trials. And this is also reflected in the fall in the number of trials, including a covariate within the analysis, which has fallen from 89% to 81%. We can also see that for trials that are still including a covariate in the analysis, far more covariates seem to be included. Um, so looking here, if we look at greater than five covariates, in 2014, this was at 8%, whereas in 2019, this has risen to 24%, including more than five covariates within the analysis. So this table here is showing the characteristics of the study split by the method of randomization used. So when we were considering the characteristics associated with the choice of method, we found two potential characteristics, which are shown here. 
So in these figures, you might see that I have highlighted the median value. And the reason that we are considering this over the mean is due to the fact that there was a number of larger studies that had a lot of centers and it skewed the mean. So the median is a more accurate representation of the data in this case. So looking at the median number of centers, we can see that minimization and stratification generally seem to have more centers with a median of 61 and 42 when compared with randomization methods that are not using a characteristic in the randomization such as simple and block which have a median value of 15 and 11 respectively. The size of the study also seems to be associated with the choice of randomization method with these larger studies seeming to use stratification and block stratification and minimization with all median values above 650 participants, whereas simple and block randomization had much smaller median study sizes with 354 and 417 respectively. So looking a little bit deeper at how the randomization method was affected by some of the characteristics, the graph here is showing the log of the sample size versus the number of variables that were included in the randomization. So the reason that we've presented the log of the sample size is for the same reason that we were looking at the median, because we had a few larger studies that had a very large sample size, it caused all of the data to kind of be clumped in one corner with a few big values at the top. So this just makes it a little bit easier to look at and understand what's happening. So you can see a clear line where stratification is more commonly used. So with one or two uh, covariates in the randomization, there seems to be a preference for using stratification. And this starts to shift a little bit when we get to three covariates where we get stratification and minimization being used. And beyond that, there's a definite preference for minimization. Um, there's also evidence to suggest that stratification is used for higher sample sizes. Um, but you might see this slightly more evidently on the next slide. Again, it is difficult because we've taken a log. Um, so it has squished everything in. Um, but in this figure, we're comparing the log of the sample size with the log of the total number of strata. So here by the number of strata, we mean the product of categories from the randomization variables. So by that, if we have severity, which was split as mild, moderate and severe, and then we had gender as male and female, this would give us six strata. So we can see evidence that trials using stratification seem to have this higher sample size, which we have here. Um, but we can also see a lower number of strata with minimization becoming much more prominent uh, after a log value of two, which is around 100 strata. So the final comparison that I wanna make within this piece of research is a study conducted by Brennan Kahan. So back in 2014, Kahan conducted a review assessing current practice in analyzing clinical trials that had used stratification or minimization. This review was over a three month period in 2010. And since it was also conducted in the New England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of the American Medical Association, the BMJ and the Lancet, we compared the findings of this review with our own review to identify any changes following Kahan's guidance. So in the conclusion of this paper, Kahan cautioned the requirements to include randomization variables within subsequent analyses. So in this table, we can see the results of Kahan's review versus the results of our review. And we can see immediately a decrease in the number of trials that are using center as a balancing factor, which has fallen from 85% to 32% in 2019. And there's also an increase in trials, including patient level prognostic factors, which has risen from 59% to 77%. Potentially more interestingly though, we can see an increase in the subsequent inclusion of variables in the analysis that have been included within the randomization. So whilst the analysis of center as a variable hasn't changed that much with an increase from 37% to 41%, if we look at the prognostic factors in trials, this has actually risen from 29% to 77%, which really shows a great uptake of Kahan's advice. 
and the overall adjustment for all balancing variables in an analysis has risen from 34% to 60%. So what have we learned from this study? Most of the individually randomized trials are using some combination of these core randomization methods, either simple block, stratification or minimization. And less than 5% of the trials that we looked at have deviated and used a different method. If we compare this to practice in 2014, there isn't much change in method use and there's very little evidence of new emerging methods being used. If anything, there actually appeared to be a shift towards an increase in the use of simpler unrestricted randomization. We also did see though this polarization of methods well, although there was an increase in the usage of simple randomization, for those who continued to include factors within the randomization, it seemed that there was a higher complexity as more factors are being included and they tended to have more strata. When considering the covariates that are associated with the choice of method, our findings seem to align um, with other research in the area. Uh, finding that the size of the study, the number of centers, and the number of randomization factors included seem to be associated with the choice of method. So for the strengths and limitations of this study, now I think it was quite a strong study, but then I would say that as I conducted it. Um, we had a large number of papers that we reviewed and they were from well-respected high impact journals. And this led to really good completeness of our data. Also, in addition to journals that had been seen in previous re reviews, we included the National Institute of Health Research's Health Technology Assessment Library, which really helped widen the scope of the review. And if you look at the results, even though it's only done so a little bit, it has done that. However, even though we do have this wider scope than previous reviews, it is still looking at five high impact journals. So we realized this might limit the generalizability of findings to other journals. And in addition to this, the findings are from 2019, which I guess you could consider slightly out of date. So this was done intentionally because we wanted to find the results without the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic um, and the impact it had on trials. But we recognize that uh, there may have been changes to practice in the last few years. So with that review of the literature review that we conducted completed, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the next section of work that we did within the thesis and link this with some of the findings from this work and findings of the previous review. So following the literature review, we wanted to better understand researchers' motivations behind why they're selecting specific randomization methods. To do this, we recruited researchers from the UK CRC and some of the Trials Methodology Research Partnership Working Groups uh, listed out here on the slide. We had a specific kind of target towards statistics, uh, IT and programmers, and then trial management to try and get a variety of different people within these groups. So we developed a topic guide with five main areas of discussion. The first really looking at how the researchers are currently selecting their randomization method. Then asking, do they have specific opinions on the method that might influence their usage of them? Then which features are important? So this is kind of coming back to that idea of balance and predictability. You know, what is it about a method that would make, make a researcher use it? And why do they consider this feature so important for their randomization? And then finally, we asked about how they're measuring and quantifying these features when they're implementing them within their own randomization. So these focus groups were conducted on Microsoft Teams and a thematic analysis was used to review transcripts and identify important topics that came up from the discussions. So for the results, we conducted four focus groups containing 25 participants from 20 clinical trials units across the country. This was made up of 20 statisticians, four programmers, and a clinical trials monitor. The final themes that we found aligned with the topic guide quite closely, but the questions of which features are being used and why they're important ended up being collapsed into one theme. So just giving a brief overview of some of the findings, for current randomization method selection, two themes seem to come out of this research. 
So the first of these really aligns with the findings from our literature review, where 10 of the participants discuss the importance of considering study design when designing their trials. Both sample size and the number of variables were mentioned as the key things to consider by six of those participants, with many but not all participants discussing three variables as a general cutoff between stratification and minimization, which again we saw um, within those graphs. The other theme that we found for selecting a randomization method was an institutional standard. So some researchers mentioned that either their institution or them personally would have a specific base method that they would use and they would need good justification to move away from this method. And that was said by 10 of our participants. So generally, this came down to expertise versus like time and cost. So for example, if a unit had a programming team and they programmed minimization, which is a slightly more complex method to program, they were far more likely to use the method because it was seen as easier to implement and it was cheaper than outsourcing randomization to another company. So skipping through a little bit, uh, I want to come back to the importance of method features, specifically balance and predictability. So as expected, both of these were brought up in the focus groups and there was a divide between which one was considered the most important. But one general thing that we did manage to get most of the participants to agree on is that balance could be accounted for in analysis while there was no accounting for a predictable sequence. There was also some conversations about other logistical is issues, such as drug supply being an important consideration. However, when it came to measuring these things, most researchers admitted that they didn't often measure them during the trial's life, and most testing would be done either in initial simulations or in production of DMC reports, both of these majorly having a focus on balance. So if anyone is interested in the full results of this research, we are looking to publish these shortly, and I'll be making sure to mention them on my Twitter, which I have left here on the slide for anyone that is interested. So what's next within my thesis? So the review of trials and the focus groups have given us a good understanding of current practice of randomization method selection, and also the reasoning behind this practice and what research is considered important. So in order to take this research further, researchers have stated the importance of balance and predictability, but they're not checking these things within their own trials. So next, I want to develop metrics that can be used by trialists to measure the effects of balance and predictability. I'm then going to use a simulation study and apply the most commonly used randomization methods to real life trial data to measure the effect the different methods have on sequences, balance and predictability for different trial situations. This will then be combined into final recommendations and the metrics will be made available for researchers to use within their own studies. I want to thank you all very much for coming along to hear more about this research and also thank you to the TMRN and for Simone for inviting me to speak with you all. I'm going to leave you with the references used in the presentation. So this top one is the reference for the paper that I presented, the systematic review. At the top of the slide, again, I have my Twitter if anyone is interested. And here we've got the references for both the Cialano and the Kahan paper. So at this point, I would like to ask if there are any questions. <laughs>